like this is one place which is kind of accepted me. I mean, you are currently building Orange Wood Labs. You know, we actually ended up building India's first uh, four-wheel drive bus in Delhi. Uh, you have raised like 5.5 million dollars. You can't do anything else, and then the money doesn't. Being an Indian immigrant building a hardware company is probably the hardest thing in the world. I'm here today with Abhinav. Abhinav, how are you? Good, good, very good. So, Abhinav, who, what do you do right now? So, I build robots, which you can or any human can just program by talking to it. So, Abhinav is the founder of a company called as Orange Wood Labs. Yes. How much have you guys raised? So, we've raised five and a half million. And how is the journey been over these years? It's been ups and downs, uh, but yes, in the end, like I get to build AI-powered robots, which are now helping people out in factories. Um, that that feeling itself is amazing. When did you start building these robots? Uh, so we started like the company started back in twenty uh, late twenty seventeen. Uh, but yes, we pivoted into building these robotic arms somewhere around twenty twenty nineteen, early twenty nineteen. Got it. And you have been on a grind since two thousand nine. Oh yes, absolutely. 2009 to 2024 now, so it's been 15 years. Been on this journey, and what Abhinav told me today is like he loves building these robots, and in an alternate life, he would be doing the same. So that's why he is here for this. Yeah, absolutely. We have recorded a great episode today, talking about his journey, starting with like early days and a lot of struggles, going through depression. uh changing ideas making it to yc raising millions of dollars and now at 5.5 continuing to build with 25 plus customers oh yes uh 25 robots installed yeah very cool so excited to share this journey with him with, with him and you all so thank you for being a watcher of this and let us know how you feel and uh, tell us your feedback excited for that thank you thank you abhinav das people usually are from bang bengal right yeah But they are, are usually from, from Bengal uh, but i am from delhi like my parents brought me to delhi um uh, but yes uh, but they are from bihar they are so we bihar. are bihari bengalis who now live in delhi and now i'm living in san francisco so uh, <laughs> it's a lot of lot of places very cool but do you speak bengali by any chance no i don't <laughs> so it looks like you are actually from delhi now because pretty much Absolutely. that's where you spent but no maybe now from san francisco because you have been living for how many years it's been 3 years now yeah <laughs> and i i feel like this is one place which has kind of accepted me i mean there is a time in your life when you think hey this is my city mm-hmm. so i think san francisco is that place where i'm feeling very much at home Yeah, very cool. So you know, we're gonna highlight a lot of parts of your story. You are currently building Orange Wood Labs, uh, which is like a hardware company. Hardware is hard, and uh, you have raised like five point five million dollars. Being an Indian immigrant, building a hardware company is probably the hardest thing in the world. So we will touch on a lot of things, but let's get started with like early years of your life. Like, how was your college like, or how was your early life like? Uh, so I was uh, pretty much a misfit most uh-huh. of my life, and um, um, I was I used to read a lot. Uh-huh. Like as a child, I was very very curious. I got into history uh, because my grandfather introduced uh-huh. me, and I was I would be you know reading a lot about okay how did what was geopolitics of the time, right? Like all of those crazy things, and then I got really into. Uh, I was very creative, and I wanted to build things. Mm-hmm. That was something which, um, uh, which kind of uh, made me get into like more technical fields. Uh, got into science exhibitions. Uh, had like a small cupboard in my in my house. Mm-hmm. We had a small house in Delhi, uh, but we had like a um, you know we have that Al- Almari uh, mm-hmm. Almira in uh, if you remember that <coughs> like weird colored. Yeah, it's like uh, a metal. No, no, no. It's like a little brown color yeah. Almira. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so um, during those years, like, <clears throat> let's say you were always curious, interested in the world. So you have you were like a very much of a knowledgeable person, not like maybe good at academics. Or were you good at academics? No, too? not at all. I used to get bored very quickly. Mm. That was one thing which I noticed. Like, like I realized it after years. And then uh, I would not get a lot of marks, but I would know a lot of things. Oh. Wow. So. I would get so you are like that great C people who actually perform very well in life, but they don't end up uh, doing very well in their academics. Absolutely. I mean, I was not. I was usually like more interested in solving the next class math book because oh, that is cool. 
you know that sounds interesting so it was one of those things and then i would get very bored uh, exams were not my thing it became it came to a point where i was not really not interested in like studying for exams uh-huh. um also had like anxiety um so all of these things combined basically i was not scoring as well uh, you know good. which my parents would would have thought okay the kid is smart but i don't know what happens <laughs> then uh, next very cool so now you uh, what how was your high school like high school wasn't that much fun i think we now i realize that it's it's more like you know you there was more focus on you know learning like as in you know just blindly learning facts and not actually learning how to do things how mm. to uh you know apply that knowledge in practical life so that is where i was like very disconnected i remember like when i finished my 12th standard board exam so i was like okay have i wasted my time mm. well i mean a lot of people i went to iit and i mean a lot of people there are also very much about like grades and you know but after, i mean getting into iit is more about getting through this place but i mean a lot of people once they get into iit some people stick to academics some people are like hey i don't want to study anymore so it's like different but i'm glad you realized it way earlier that you want to focus more on knowledge than grades yeah absolutely and i just wanted to build things i was so curious about okay i want to build something with my hands and um, even like so i joined uh, this college in ip university oh. um uh, wasn't like very happy about things but yeah at least after a while i get to shape things so i was i became the vice captain of the uh, baha sai team which was basically building a small car for a competition right cool. that was the first time it came to india this is back in 2007 uh-huh. and we got the opportunity to build a small car which uh-huh. would go for a competition uh-huh. and that just changed my life you know suddenly like i was I was just not happy in college uh, where you know we were like I would I remember like I would not even do things uh, even the labs uh-huh. where they were teaching us welding and how to do fabrication they just made it extremely boring for everyone mm. instead of you know doing something fun and then I did not learn any of those things and then when I when we started building the car, car I was just getting into it so I was so happy about it and you know we actually ended up building india's first uh, four wheel drive baha sai vehicle wow yeah very cool so in undergrad you kind of found that you love building and you also got a chance to be able to build this car mm-hmm. then how did this whole thing about entrepreneurship came into your life so as as a kid i was very uh, impressed by henry ford uh-huh. right he was he was the elon musk of his time right yeah. like and for for the probably the first 100 years uh i was like super impressed i had read his read a lot of about his stories you know how he actually ended up building um the whole basically the whole mass manufacturing the automobile revolution and i was you know i had like always this idea you know i'll i'll start like a car company of as a kid i i would always think like that hey i'll have this in my car if i build build it like this mm-hmm. so uh and during the college years i also got into motor sport so mm-hmm. that was like pure passion mm-hmm. you know it's one of those things which can keep me up for like 3 days mm-hmm. you know i'll just read stats i'll just try to understand the technicalities mm-hmm. and if you're coming from like a you know engineering design background that's like that's amazing you know there are like these crazy car people or rather motor sports people and then there are rest of the rest of the engineers so i was probably one of these guys even re- thought like hey i can i should be doing this mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. as my life's you know thing mm-hmm. and the way to do that was okay you know let's work in the automotive industry for a bit then we'll apply for a masters mm-hmm. uh, usually in uk they have these motor sports master courses wow so i was singing on those lines uh-huh. and then uh, i was working for this company called stone sona koyo so what is it sona koyo ha uh-huh. um yeah recently met the ceo of the the same company when i was in india and then they are like now the biggest suppliers for uh, powertrain components to companies like tesla and everyone wow they they actually yeah, and you work for this driving, company yeah uh-huh. uh, if you're driving a tesla right now you're 
uh, drive shaft might have been made by them in Gurgaon. So it's in actually, Gurgaon. Yeah. <laughs> so India's manufacturing is there. Like I mean, a lot it of, is there. Uh, it is there. It doesn't get like the kind of news which we want to read, right? India automotive sector has been like I think the num- maximum. I think it's uh, roughly at the fifth or sixth number in mm-hmm. terms of cars produced every year. Mm-hmm. The market itself and it's actually at par at everywhere everyone else so if you go to like you know if you look at quality standards it's actually as good as japan uh and the u.s it's kind of funny to me like i just whenever someone talks about manufacturing i think when they talk about manufacturing in india the whole story is like no india doesn't manufacture anything and uh, (laughs) i mean here when i'm talking to you are like oh even in tesla you might see parts made in gurgaon and here everyone is like, hey, Elon Musk sell Tesla in India. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's again, there are a lot of other issues, but there are, there are entrepreneurs who have been doing this since 80s, uh, ever since Maruti came mm. to India. Mm. Or Maruti started and Suzuki came to India. Mm. Uh, there has been a history of, you know, and I, I tend to look at things from a, you know, engineering culture, mm-hmm. right? A culture is like, okay, if... Like what is fine and what is not fine in terms of engineering, right? So it was Maruti and Suzuki basically who made India's culture Mm. of manufacturers better. Mm. Like before that, like I remember there was this uh, book called Maruti Story by the person who, like the first chairman of Mm. uh, Maruti. Mm -hmm. He said that before Maruti came to, came into production, the armed forces used to have a mechanic check each and every car. Because Ah. the quality standards were not there. Oh, I see. So imagine like, you know, it would take almost because the number of orders which they were getting, Ah. it would take months before they would have accepted everything. Mm. So, you know, whenever I talk about manufacturing, one question comes to my mind. Like, you know, as when I was graduating from my undergrad, all mechanical engineer or electrical engineer ended up doing taking software jobs. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like, those are the jobs that are, available and there is a and there is not like not that much job and that's probably how i will look at the deficit like talent is ready to work in this but there is not enough opportunities in that what's your thinking around it oh absolutely i think that kind of led me to my first startup Mm -hmm. and um, i was working in this company and then i was thinking about you know doing a motorsports course and then getting into formula one or any other field Mm -hmm. and then i met meet this guy at an exhibition who tells me, you know what, like, just go and travel, like, a little bit in the rural area. Uh-huh. Like, just 50 kilometers outside of Delhi, mm-hmm. you'll see something which will blow your mind. Mm-hmm. And that's that's the time when I saw a Jugaad. So, Jugaad is a vehicle, uh, you know, which has a pumps engine, uh-huh. a agriculture pumps engine. It uses diesel engine and then it's made out of construction uh, material. Mm. Like it's uh, the, the the steel panels which they make chassis, that is actually used. That's meant for construction purposes. Oh. And then they use wood and everything else from an old jeep to build up everything. The the vehicle is extremely noisy, uh, very very dangerous, but it gets the job done for rural areas. Wow! So there is a manufacturing which is hap- which has already been going on for decades, I guess, in the rural India. Exactly. And then there was such a disconnect, right? Like I am having a fancy degree. I'm working in with like the best Uh places in India in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And just 50 kilometers outside, Uh there's another world which is untouched by people like me. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the the question came that, okay, India is is producing so many mechanical engineers every year. Uh Why is nobody looking at this? Uh So it it kept, you know, like this thought kept boiling inside me. Uh And then... uh, uh, in 2008, there was like a layoff and I was given an option. Hey, could you take like some, uh, you know, leave for some time? Uh-huh. So I had an option of getting back, but then they just wanted to like, you know, write off because every department was fighting people. So I had an option of like just going out and exploring this. And I was like, yeah, why not? Like I want this. Yeah. So, and I remember I was taking my gate exam as well because I was like, okay, you know what? Like if I go for a master's, I'll probably get time to build one of these things. I'll maybe learn enough. Mm-hmm. And then during my gate exam, I remember like I was, uh, you know, I think I was, I had like maybe roughly 12 questions, the last ones. Uh-huh. Um, and gate exam, you know, if you think of first principles, it's actually very easy to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah. I had like those 12 questions where you had to do calculations and they don't allow a calculator. Mm-hmm. I, at least at that time, they did not. Yeah. And I was like, 
what am i doing i don't want to do this uh-huh. because suddenly you know there was like a i had to do those calculations and i was like okay i don't want to do this uh-huh. and then i i you know just started jotting down things like okay you know what like if, what if i had to start a business how would it look like mm. and i did not finish the exam uh those 12 questions and they don't let you out before you know a certain time mm. so i was just doing that that was the only time i had a moment of clarity and i i thought i'm going to start a company wow so <laughs> that and then was, you did your first company which is actually to make a jugad yeah, that was yeah so a jugad alternative which would be legal mm. which would be safer mm. and you would be able to build um, you know basically like basically a better off roader It's kind of funny the when, when you tell me the way you are explaining me hardware it feels like software it's like as if like it's super easy like hey add safety some compliance and you know um but hardware is real hard so how was that journey like building this this physical labor uh-huh. i mean uh, the way I'll, i'll explain it and you know there are like so many layers to it um you know when you are a child you're always shown mechanics or people who work with their hands or something you don't want to do Uh, India also has a caste system which kind of pushes people towards a certain kind of role, like uh-huh. people who work with their hands are not considered some someone who's. This is this is a very important thing that you're mentioning because if you think about it, people go to gym to work out and do physical work, and here we are talking about people trying to isolate people who are actually doing the mechanical work. Exactly. So I used to hang out. I hang out with mechanics uh-huh. you know and I knew like a lot about their and they come from a very different socio economic uh-huh. strata right like someone who's gone to college is not never going to do mechanic work and it's kind of sad because the the quality of mechanical engineers which we have un- without doing hand work is actually bad yeah. people don't know enough you know they are always thinking from a you know a, a CAD perspective instead of like actual physical perspective Yeah the real skill is not there and that's why maybe like you know when we talk about employability of people in hardware because we don't get to do that work on the ground a lot of the people are not employable um well i mean i think last event we hosted there was a discussion where this guy is like actually that problem is not just for india this guy was saying that he is hiring as a hardware business he's hiring people who are actually in the field out there building stuff rather than people taking people with degrees Absolutely and this is so so interesting right like we we've, we've done this for such a long time i think and you know i see as an immigrant i'm seeing america right like the the america which i saw while i was growing up which was actually like in in terms of physical hardware they were the the, the biggest the biggest power and mm. you know that was something to aspire for uh-huh. now you don't see it like that right mm. to build anything hardware it's very very hard and especially if you're living in the bay area i remember i was having a having a discussion and there were like four mechanical engineers in the room where two of them were our customers mm. and then we couldn't figure out okay do we have a place where we can weld things together oh yeah dang. and wel- without welding you can't build like a- exactly it's it's i mean i'm sure like obviously there are shops yeah. where, where where you can but yeah. then none of us had access to it and the only way was to basically find someone online and then send them the drawing and then they just do their thing and send it to you back in 15 wow. days at that, a very this is high area. cost yeah this is san francisco so finding a welder in san francisco has been super hard and you have to send the drawings online and someone will make it and then send it ship it to you exactly i mean it's it's not straight forward uh-huh. and the, the problem is it's like density of people who can weld uh-huh. is actually very low uh-huh. or maybe even solder Uh-huh. right so these are some of the skills which let's say the engineers back in the 80s and 90s used to have uh-huh. now engineers don't have these mm very interesting yeah. okay well so you did you started building this high quality jugad uh, how did that journey go uh so it was quite hard uh-huh. uh we got like some grant money to start with and from the government uh, of india from the government of india mm-hmm. but yeah it it had like a lot of strings attached mm-hmm. um we found ourselves always you know trying to raise more money mm-hmm. uh in uh, like either from government or even the things which were promised to us they took time and mm-hmm. then uh, the, the problem was the stakeholders on the other side of the table did not understand it enough mm-hmm. right if they were they were founders or they had they were people who had built companies mm-hmm. 
they would understand or empathize with the person who is doing it like mm-hmm. i remember uh, there was a grant um uh, forgetting the name it was called tep or something mm-hmm. and then the, the the person on the other side was like a d level scientist that's what that's what they are like d or c mm-hmm. you know that's like the entry level scientific position mm-hmm. and you know someone who's been doing this as a government job they don't realize like what the person on the other side might be going through right mm-hmm. they really want to like you are so passionate about it you can't mm-hmm. you can't do anything else and then the money doesn't come Mm. So that was one problem which I felt and you know in in hindsight I'll probably like just find another thing and then do this on the side instead of like just mm. uprooting myself so I I actually uh, went to Ahmedabad mm. at the NID campus that's where I built the 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 Jugaad alternative wow yeah. very cool um I'm going to pause for a second mm-hmm. can you move your chair in this direction like this yeah yeah I think it changes a lot of things okay let's mm-hmm. continue Um so you built this Jugaad Juga in NID in Ahmedabad yes. that's where you were like okay I have the people who can support me in building this yes uh you got some grants then what what's next uh so we ended up building this it took 3 years to build the prototype mm-hmm. it took time it uh, it was again hard a lot of physical labor like i remember you know like i would just be like fully doused in grease and everything else and then Uh-huh. i would just keep building it and it took 3 years uh, but we had a prototype which was working really well uh-huh. and we would start showing it off uh-huh. uh we were trying to get more grants uh-huh. um and obviously like i got into the trap where i was trying to raise money for this uh-huh. and i feel like now i should not have done that i should have found another way another problem is like in hindsight i was trying to make everything legal uh-huh. uh one of the requirements like the legality was one of the problems which people faced uh-huh. in the rural areas because uh the the jugaads which they were using the jugaad vehicles they did not have any paperwork so mm-hmm. it's it's illegal mm-hmm. so police can like confiscate any time there was this uh, bollywood movie uh, 12th fail mm-hmm. so in in that the protagonist jugaad gets taken by the police and that's how he becomes like a you know uh-huh. he realizes i want to become a police officer uh-huh. so that happens a lot so uh-huh. i i i mean it's kind of funny because i mean just on this story first of all getting through legal frameworks in india is very hard and then first of all building is hard then getting through the government frameworks is very hard um and someone who is like at least trying to innovate at their own level they're kind of getting a lot of pushback from everyone involved absolutely uh, it was i think it was it became very lonely uh-huh. it was hard uh-huh. even though i was at a place an id where most of people were students but you still like get that pressure from everyone around you right like why you are doing this mm-hmm. and i was one of those like very idealist you know 22 25 year old who's mm-hmm. like no I- i'm going to build this mm-hmm. and then when i started meeting some of the so uh, i've lived a very protected life in in delhi mm. but then this was the time when i got to travel to rural areas and that was an eye opener mm-hmm. right it it almost became to a point that this is my calling and i really want to help these people out mm. if if i would have made this in right time it would have actually pulled a lot of people out from poverty so you know if you own a truck you can almost become a mafia in in rural areas in it mm. like you can control the prices Mm-hmm. and heard like loads of stories you know like if you go to the the pushkar cattle fair and that's very that that's also on the hippy trail so yeah. you know you'll find a lot of people coming from all over the world to uh, you know the, who come there but it's actually a cattle fair where people are just bringing their camels buffaloes everything mm-hmm. um and over there like we found cases like where you know the the cost of the buffalo wasn't much but cost of taking it to your village was like three times Ah. so uh, lots of such stories so you were seeing that there is a real need here there is a demand these uh, people farmers need your product you want to build it you are struggling with this legal framework and then you are like okay i want to raise money and then that did not work out yeah that did not work out and it was like so i was doing it from 2009 to huh. 2015 wow and the only successful car company in 100 years was tesla at that time Ah so it was like okay somebody had to prove and especially i think i mean i was trying to raise from india the venture capital did not exist or even if it did it was like in very s- small places mm-hmm. 
and uh, they did not have any pattern to you know match myself me with so you worked on this for 6 years and you yes. after that what happened did you end up closing it down and mm-hmm. yeah it was hard and it was one of those things where you know it's like okay it's your thing you want to build this because you've seen the pain of people mm-hmm. uh and i was again i'm extre- i was extremely idealist like in my 20s mm-hmm. where you know i was like okay there's no point of like becoming an engineer if it cannot like solve these problems mm-hmm. you know very much like the uh what was that movie sharukh khan uh, which one where he's he's a nasa scientist but goes to oh is it a uh, nasa scientist yeah it's a famous one is it yeah like... even i'm forgetting yeah uh, yeah so this so this so yes, yeah yes. so that was like my so this movement but i was <laughs> yeah, not like yeah. moving much like right so i <laughs> yeah. i was i was very convinced that this is what i need to do yeah uh and that was hard like just leaving shutting that down i mean it's kind of crazy that you know after six you work in six years and then you don't see any success but here when i'm looking at your story today you are like very much successful in a lot of ways with like raising so much money building a product which has customers and having a hardware but you know what people don't like to understand is like there are a lot of failures fail stories here to reach to this stage but what i'm seeing is like there is a pattern of like okay i'm not going to give up because i want to be the best engineer i want to be in hardware absolutely it it was it came to a point where you know like the reason why i i left my motorsports dream because i realized that okay one end of like okay 10 years down the line even if i play my best cards uh-huh. right i'll be a formula 1 engineer uh-huh. and my best like in my my best life would be maybe you know subtracting like one second from someone's lap time mm. it's huge yeah it's huge and on the other side you know there are like so many people who might need this vehicle to like become you know to to kind of climb up the socio economic ladder wow i could do this this is such a beautiful way to represent this like one side one second from the lap and on one side there are million people or billions of people you would be able to get out of like into their next phase into be able to have a better quality life absolutely and transportation was something which affects a lot of things so kids cannot go to schools school uh most healthcare facilities in india at that time were at least 8 kilometers mm-hmm. away so 5 miles away and there's no way you can walk there mm-hmm. and uh, the markets were not accessible for most farmers so like the the truck truck guy is usually the mafia who decides the prices mm-hmm. right. so we found a lot of these these problems which could have been solved by like personal ownership of these mm-hmm. small trucks which i was trying to build mm-hmm. Yeah. So 2015 you ended up shutting it down what did yeah. you end up So I next? actually got a call from my combinator for an interview in 2015 yes wow so so that was the summer of 15 batch uh-huh. um, that was the first time I was traveling to the US and uh-huh. before that I never really thought of myself as someone who would want to move here uh-huh. you know that's it was like you know this is what I want to do uh-huh. and then you know I came to the to the bay area First of all I thought okay everywhere is the same you know okay Americans are like very optimistic uh-huh. and one of the things which I remember like having a conversation with my then co-founders uh, so it was like a reattempt at this uh-huh. so I had like new co-founders and then well, my co-founder uh, who's a bay area native uh-huh. her grandparents just wanted to invest after talking to me in half an hour wow and I was like okay this is weird like I've never seen this mm-hmm. and uh, you know this was like 2015 i also like during my vice interview i met uh, sam altman you know it was it was fun right like yeah. okay these are some of the people who now you see in flesh yeah and then after talking to some people i was like okay you know what like if i have to do the next thing probably this is where i want to come to mm-hmm. in in the back of my head that that was there like mm-hmm. okay you know we should come to yc yeah and um, after like um Did so we didn't get the no no he didn't get selected didn't get selected but then that was the first time i had a holiday kind of a holiday so my cousin lives in semi valley in near la and then you know i just spent some time with them uh, she has two kids and i was i just had like the time of my life i i did not know like okay you could just chill mm. for some time mm-hmm. and that's what i did um and it it kind of changed the way i was thinking that yeah this could be a life as well mm-hmm. where you could be not just worrying about things and then just be chilling mm-hmm. and um, 
So after that, I was, I, I started consulting. I came back to India, I was consulting, but I got depressed. Mm, so yeah. you got back to India and then you were like, well, you saw all this beauty in Bay Area and you were like, I want to crush hair. You didn't make it to IC. You went back to India and you are like now feeling like, well, I failed in my life. And yeah, also like I, I want to build something like it, it was like, okay, I was, I was consulting. I was getting paid. I was living in my back to move back to my parents' house. It was fun. It was comfortable. Uh It was one of those things where I would just sleep 12 hours a day. Uh I was getting fat. I was life was comfortable, Uh but obviously like there was, (laughs) that was not the way to live. And at that time, my parents were also not sure what happened to me. Oh, because I, I used to be extremely dynamic. Uh-huh. Now I wasn't. Ah. And then I was just trying to find meaning of it. And then, you know, there's like this saying, right? Like men would not go to therapists, but start another hardware company. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's what I ended up uh-huh. doing. I was trying to like play with few ideas. Uh-huh. One of them was, um, so my co-founder Aditya, he uh-huh. used to complain a lot. And so we know each other from NID days. He was a student at NID studying furniture design. Uh-huh. And, uh, he used to complain a lot about, dude, what am I doing? You know, that was like, okay, very exist- existential for both of us. Yeah. And um, one of the things he said, like, you know what? It takes me, took me three months to just design this tool. I'm not happy. Hmm. And I'm like, okay, bro. Like, okay, I'm coming from the automotive industry. It huh. takes like 90 seconds for a car to get out of the assembly line. You are taking that long. There's some, some, some mismatch. Uh-huh. And... Uh, then we realized that, okay, the furniture industry itself is like very fragmented. Huh. If you want to make anything custom, it just takes too long. Mm. And another thing which was happening was co-working spaces. Okay. There were a lot of startups getting started and then all of them will just look for a place in co-working space. Uh-huh. So this is 2016, 2017, mm-hmm. where everyone is like, every uh, mid-career uh, entrepreneur uh-huh. would start a co-working space wow. because that is like the I mean I know thing. there was some startups that started in India at that time like everyone was like okay let's create a co-working space yeah exactly uh-huh. so we were like okay you know what like we could capitalize on this mm-hmm. and then uh, we were thinking you know we can make like furniture which is made out of CNC machine CNC machine is like a you know imagine a 3d printer but instead of printing it yeah. cuts pieces of wood or metal yeah. or anything yeah um, so we thought, okay, you know what, like we can just go to someone who has a CNC machine and then get it done. Mm-hmm. And then we realized that the amount of money which they were charging for just making those pieces uh-huh. was how much Aditya was making in a month. Oh, So it became very clear that, yeah, this is not the way. And I was like, you know, very overconfident, second time entrepreneur. I was like, okay, you know what? Like I can build this. Like there are so many open source designs available. We can tweak it a bit mm-hmm. and then we'll just make it. And, uh, and I had exhausted my savings after that. Like I was, I quit. Uh, I was not having fun. Mm-hmm. I quit. I was thinking, you know what? Like I'll do something else, but I'm not going to consult for a while now. Mm-hmm. So we just poured whatever savings we had into building the CNC machine. Mm-hmm. And then we, thought okay it's going to take maybe 15 days for someone like me and Aditya to build this Mm -hmm. it took us five months oh my god (laughs) and we were like in in our sweaty basement in in our parents basement we were just doing this for the longest this was in India or here this was in India this was all in India yes in uh, Ahmedabad or where this was in Faridabad Faridabad. so my parents uh, so my father retired Uh Uh, so earlier we were in government quarter Mm -hmm. but then when he retired we got a house actually kind of told them to instead of like buying let's say a small flat Uh i brainwashed them into like building a house so that i get the basement (laughs) so that i get to work right like i i i still regret it because my parents haven't left that place and that place is not yet developed enough Uh it's kind of funny by the way i am from delhi for the what too like so it's like very close to for uh for the one water we will talk about it another day yeah (laughs) (laughs) but here you are like hey five you are like again getting into hardware with aditya you spent five months what happened then so we started producing furniture now Oh, wow. Yes. For co-working spaces. For co-working or earlier, it was like, okay, whoever takes it. Uh And we had like a constraint. We could only cut pieces of wood, which was like 
four by four feet maximum size because mm-hmm. we couldn't afford a bigger bed. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we started making, and that was like mostly home looking furniture. Uh-huh. But then we created a website, did not know we could do any SEO or anything. Uh-huh. And basically there were like maybe 140 people who came in the first month. Wow. And that was it. No, nobody bought it. Like not, even, even our friends and family did not buy any furniture. Okay. Us. But they showed up. Yeah. 140 people showed up. Yeah. And <laughs> the whole one month. Huh? <laughs> and then you have all this furniture ready now. Yes. And then we got our first co-working customer. Okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was like the starting point. And then even those guys, like we did our first one, then we did our second one. Those guys just wanted to expand. So they got another space. We did that as well. And we got another office uh-huh. through like another connection. And then we had like three offices, roughly 8K of revenue. Uh-huh. And then that was the time YC call happened. Uh, and then YC accepted you. Yes. So you came on a visit again for the interview? Uh, yeah. So they usually call you. Like they, yeah. they used to pay for the interview and that was again another chance to come here and then. Very cool. So yeah. now you got through Y. You came to yeah. YC, got into YC. Yeah. And also like our, our third co-founder had also joined us. Mm-hmm. So he, he was shut, he was also like shutting down his fintech company. Uh-huh. So it was like all three of us in not so great mood, but also looking forward. So a very, very uh, crazy combination. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. So now you have YC, you have a manufacturing facility in India or what? It was, was still my basement. Your basement. Uh, before the YC money came, we did not have an office. Uh, we just took it from the YC money and YC used to give 120k at that time. Yeah. So now it's 500, but uh, at that time it was 120k. Very cool. So now you have YC money, you have a lot of recognition. How much did you end up uh, raising at that time? So at the demo day, we raised around 340k in total. 340k you raised and you are like now... And you continued on the business model of selling co-working furniture? Yes, yes. So we were like, okay, there are so so many companies who want this furniture. And we, we actually got a lot of orders at the time. Uh, it was, it became clear, okay, this is working. We have product market fit. Mm-hmm. And uh, what we realized after that was, okay, what we've done is like during YC, we've made one process, which is like extremely fast. Uh-huh. So that was just cutting wood because that was being done on our machines Ah. but rest of the processes were not they were still being done by humans Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the other problem was we were finding hard to like get painters or or uh, you know carpenters Mm -hmm. it was very hard Mm -hmm. like in in a place like noida which is again the industrial center for north india so many migrant laborers come Mm -hmm. but we were still having problems Mm. And so after digging in, we realized nobody wants to do these jobs anymore. It's much easier to like start driving for Uber or, you know, do Uber Eats or any of these other things, mm-hmm. which pays better than, you know, being a carpenter or being a painter. It's kind of interesting to just understand the story. Like, you know, physical labor is considered as not good in a lot of ways, especially from India's, maybe the caste system, whatever has impacted. Mm-hmm. And no manufacturing, but I mean, that's where actually there are a lot of jobs and we also do all this physical labor in other forms, Mm -hmm. but people like going to the gym to work out, but don't want to consider that as a part of the lifestyle. Absolutely. I think there was a, there is, there's a difference between, you know, how we see things and uh, I mean, I've seen people who are happier, like the, 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 the farmers are actually very happy people. Uh, for some reason, you know, they're, they're working hard in their fields all day and they're happy. Very interesting. Yeah. And, um, used to be similar for factory workers as well. Uh-huh. Uh, but yes, but yeah, like the white collar workers, they, they just don't find that happiness anymore. So mm-hmm. they have to find like their happiness in some other places, like going to the gym. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very interesting. <laughs> so now, uh, you raise this money, um, you felt like, okay, now we can crush with this startup or how was that journey? Like? So then we basically were so dependent on human labor that are like, usually, you know, you, you push your startup to the breaking point. Mm-hmm. Our breaking point was the part where we could not find enough people who could paint. Oh. And then we started digging in, found out that nobody wants to paint anymore. Like nobody even, wants yeah, paint. nobody wants to paint anymore. Like it's, it's one of those jobs which does not pay as much. And also it's creating problems with like, uh, you know, because people are inhaling 
uh, these fumes the whole day. Young people kind of realize it. It's it's a health hazard. And then the older people who are in this profession, they don't want their children to join this. Interesting. Yeah. So it's a health concern and... And also doesn't pay much. Doesn't pay much. And I mean, it's very interesting. So one thing I don't understand because supply and demand gap is what is filled by the labor in a way. Now there are all these, there is a demand for a painter and there are less people who are choosing painting as a trade. But then there is demand for painting. So so why are the few painters who are there, they must be making more money now? Absolutely. They are making more money. Uh, but... You know, it's one of those things where if the sticker shock is too high, you'll either change the business. That's something which which we also kind of got to a point where we realize, okay, this is not sustainable. Uh-huh. We, If we have built a robot for doing something like cutting, we need to build a robot for painting. Okay. That is when it becomes more sustainable. And then we started talking to some of the bigger paint shops. Mm-hmm. Like there were a lot of automotive paint shops in Faridabad, Gurgaon. We started talking to them. Their biggest problem was like we train someone for a, in a uh, you know for for a month, and then within three months they leave the job for somebody else. Now there is a supply. There's a supply of young people who want to learn this, but then that's like still not something which which people see as a career move. Mm. Very interesting. So they don't want to do this long term. Exactly. So then you are like, okay, we want to build a robot for painting. Exactly. Uh-huh. That's how it started and. Um, we ended up like building one or two models and then uh, somewhere around 2019, we realized, okay, this is what we need to do. This is how, this is what our alpha is going to be because, okay, furniture, maybe we'll touch like few companies, but our biggest impact is going to be if we make uh, this robot, robot mm-hmm. arm. And another, uh, another reason why we got into it was uh, after realizing that the robot arms were very, very expensive. Mm-hmm. At that time, it was very expensive. Now, the prices have come down a bit. Um, but at that time, the robot arm which we wanted, which was replacing one person from the line, uh, was costing $35,000. Okay. Now, to someone, you know, I'm a mechanical engineer. I used to work in the automotive industry. where My job used to be, how do I replace, uh, you know, how do I make this 28 cent rivet for a Toyota car Mm -hmm. from 28 cents to 7 cents. Mm -hmm. So very much like first principle thinking before it was cool. Mm -hmm. So it like it was very hard to digest that something which you can keep on your desktop, you know, weighs like 24 kilograms is going to cost that much. What is there? Mm -hmm. Uh, Versus, you know, like a BMW 3 Series. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So... It became very clear, okay, there's something missing here. Either it's scale or either the kind so, of components. Just so that I understand. Yeah. So, you're developing this paint robot. Mm-hmm. You say $35,000 is the cost of making this robot. That no, no, no. So, the if if I would have bought it from uh-huh. the market, uh-huh. that's how much it was costing. Okay, so the robot yeah. was costing in the market $35,000. Yes. And you were like, okay, this having this robot would not make a lot of sense. So, you were like... Now we got to build it in a better, at a better price. Exactly. Okay. And it was just to solve the problem for someone like me, you know, who has like a furniture shop uh-huh. and then cannot hire painters. So it, it was very clear. Okay. This very is how it's going to look like. Uh-huh. Let's say if this is the condition in 2018, how it's going to look like in 2025. Yes. And, you know, typically you want to look at, look ahead, right? Yes. Like what are the going to be, be the problems? If people don't want to work right now, uh-huh. then the employment is going to change even much more. It's going yeah, to look very trend. different. It's a great trend to map where you are like, okay, well, this is going to, the cost of this robot, if we do not bring down the, co- I mean, there is an opportunity here. If we can bring down the cost of robot, exactly. then there is demand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the, the demand will unlock. And that was something like we basically pivoted from a PMF startup to doing deep tech. Uh-huh. And obviously, again, my thinking was, you know what, like we can do this within a year. Uh And then obviously it took five years. Uh (laughs) Five years in your hair, the robot paints. Yeah, paints, uh, does machine tending now, like you saw the doing bartending. Yeah, Yeah, so (laughs) the robot now does bartending, 
you know the robot also does painting what are the other things that the robot does uh, so it can do machine tending so imagine mm-hmm. like you need a human operator to be doing any kind of machine mm-hmm. operation now is you can teach a robot very quickly like within a mm-hmm. few hours you can teach a robot uh tell it to do something in natural language and it will be able to replicate wow, very cool. and how many robots do you have deployed so we point? are uh, ending this year by roughly more than 25 units now 25 yeah. units are already deplo- deployed in yes. the US or outside uh, the US it's state? India and US both India and US both yeah. so your customers are in India and US both and uh, what are the use cases primarily so mostly painting painting uh-huh. has has seen like the biggest and uh-huh. then second is machine learning these are the two okay very cool uh, so what's like a uh, like i mean i'm seeing you build all this in india first mm-hmm. and then you are like okay now i got to move to bay area to figure it out what 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 did you find difference Uh so uh, you know coming back to like my time in 2015 the reason why I had to shut down my startup was because I couldn't raise enough money mm-hmm. and uh, I remember like for the furniture idea during Y Combinator like this is before pivot mm-hmm. uh I remember like the first 10k I raised mm-hmm. it was on an email ah so post demo day everyone was just giving me money right uh-huh. like here i'm coming from like i've spent 30 years being a extremely resource constrained uh-huh. environment uh-huh. and suddenly i'm here uh-huh. who's just like after the demo day people are just giving me money uh-huh. so i'm like okay this is awesome right like yeah. for yeah. someone who's who's not been here and yeah. uh you know people are just throwing money at you uh-huh. for for doing your shit mm-hmm. it's uh, it, it was very very encouraging even post that i found times when you know i was like lost all hope and then suddenly you know someone just something magical happens and you know someone just comes either a customer or a, or an investor just comes so, in so 340k you raised then you ended up now at 5.5 million you have raised total how was that journey like in the middle uh okay it was hard so, okay so 2019 we just spent all our money uh-huh. and uh, i remember we could not pay salaries we had to lay off almost everyone uh-huh. and then i came to the us just to raise uh-huh. um, and then at that time adya's father also passed away uh-huh. so it was very hard for like hard from everywhere uh-huh. and i remember me and akash my other co-founder we were in san francisco uh-huh. trying to get meetings uh-huh. nobody was talking to us at the time uh-huh. so it was you know i was like okay how could i do this like i have i struggled for most of my life most of my 20s to get that cash in for doing my things now i had that option and i blew it uh-huh. and so it it became very hard like internally it was very hard uh-huh. so that was like the feeling which i was getting then uh, my co-founder akash he's he's like one of those guys who's you know if if going gets tough uh-huh. he becomes a completely different beast right mm-hmm. like most of us would just go down head sh- shit is not happening yeah. he's like he's a very different person then uh-huh. he just started reaching out to everyone on linkedin in san francisco who had angel investor in the their name uh-huh. just kept reaching out you know i remember like there was a time when i just woke up mm-hmm. and i'm saying hey you know i did like uh, 500 uh, reach outs uh-huh. I'm like dude and Crazy. i'm still not sure what's happening you know in my head my company's value is zero i've already blew it yes and but yeah kept trying you know i was like okay if this guy like you know if he believes it i should keep doing it yes. you know that's yes. what you need to do yes and then we were almost like out of money uh, we had taken a sublet which we didn't pay for to uh-huh. begin with. Uh-huh. So how you couldn't you couldn't pay for your house at that time. Absolutely. We uh-huh. we had zero food as well like uh-huh. between us we had like maybe $200. Uh-huh. And then uh, you know like I was I remember like there was one time when I was coming back from a meeting I was walking because we couldn't pay uh-huh. and uh, pay for like Uber or anything and then I just come and see like open the fridge uh-huh. and there was food there. Huh? So <laughs> Akash had like talked to one of his relatives blackmailed him into like giving him some money and then that's how we got the fridge full wow. so that happened and then i remember like i was just living on bananas so uh-huh. bananas is my like thing okay if you're living on bananas because you get like the best uh-huh. calorific value bang <laughs> for best bang for calorific value yeah uh um, so i living on that and then suddenly there were like this this ip lawyer we spoke to uh-huh. who wanted to just talk to us 
and i was like okay dude we have like an ip lawyer but there was like some other deal which we did before that and then they had filed for us mm. so like okay let's go mm-hmm. there's no harm and uh, this was like maybe we had two days money left for san francisco mm-hmm. that that that's how it was mm. and uh, so we met this guy and he just talks you know basically understood what our technology was doing mm. and he had like a very straight face so we did not know what happened mm. we were trying to like warm up to him just to understand and we did we had no clue what's happening uh-huh. and so it was like okay this is fun let's go and then we had to leave the city because we were just out of cash mm. so i went uh, to live with one of my friends uh-huh. in new york and he uh, akash went to his uh, aunt who was living in seattle at the time uh-huh. because we had zero cash now so i remember like getting to my friend's house i had like i was on my last 2 dollars just somehow you know went to the f train to like in new york to mm. get to her house mm. so wow. it was crazy yeah <laughs> yeah and uh, i think within a week i got an email uh-huh. that hey can i like invest 50k in your company and i was like okay what is wrong with you man like <laughs> like that's the first reaction which i yes. had because you know i'm like in my head put my value of my company as zero like even the technology which you know we created to zero but then he was like you know he is like this stanford professor like he teaches us ip law at stanford and he's a electrical engineer uh-huh. who really loved what we were doing uh-huh. and he saw the merit and then you know like that the life lesson there was no matter what happens you need to look at absolutes mm. instead of like putting your feelings inside it or whatever is happening with you versus you know what the potential is going to be if you yeah. do this mm. so that was like the craziest life lesson uh-huh. and then post that i went back to india uh you know we were building like the version uh, like the new robot uh-huh. uh took some time took some more money and then pandemic happened so it was crazy um mm. uh, But yeah, we were able to raise, like, keep doing the work, mm. and we had like a prototype ready by like uh, the early 2021. Mm. Yeah, the one which you see now, that like the first version was developed in 2021. Mm. Yeah, wow, very cool. So now, uh, how did it change from 50k to like now a 5.5? What was that journey like? So we kept raising uh-huh. like little bit from uh, here and there. So now w- one person putting in fifty k is very different story than how much did, how much did you end up raising at that time? Uh, so twenty nineteen like roughly seventy k. Uh-huh. Then twenty twenty was hard. Uh-huh. Uh, one of my co founders again had to like do some work to basically consult so that we can keep paying the bills. Uh-huh. uh some of our team members stuck by us and so they they kept, we kept building mm. even during the pandemic we just kept our lights on uh-huh. uh made sure that people are working wow this, um, this is i mean in software people don't talk about these things that much but i mean in hardware it's really hard it is because again coordination used to be extremely difficult like i remember i used to be the courier guy in in india mm. because like the only way so that there's no public transportation so i was the only person who who was driving people around and then you know just uh, be- becoming the courier person if someone goes someone is not well i'll probably get them food yeah so i was doing all of that uh-huh. uh, for the longest time uh-huh. um and then uh, in in uh, in 2021 we started getting in some more money uh-huh. and that was the time i i moved to the us mm-hmm. uh, it was very clear that yes if we want to raise in a certain way we were like getting investor interest in india as well but then there was a problem like we would uh, like the valuation expectations wouldn't match and we were very clear that yes if we want to because like this is going to be capital intensive we need to raise a lot of money mm. our dilution will not be optimal mm. if we kept doing that mm. so uh, so i moved to the us and then we raised another uh, i think 600k in 2021 mm. and then uh we got our first customer in the bay area so we were building for them uh building like a whole system for them and then mm. uh we started raising again and then we were almost at a point where you know we almost like um mm-hmm. you know, almost about to die mm. and then there were like i think 7 days worth of money left in the company ha huh. and i remember like uh, so we used to work out of fort mason uh-huh. at the time at founders inc and i remember driving into 
Fort Mason and then there was a spot right next to the gate of Fort Mason and yeah. I was like there was I I saw someone uh, you know I I yeah. saw unhoused person there and then I was dude that's a great spot like we could probably live there yeah. that's so that that was going on in my mind yeah. uh and then I think within few hours we were like uh, we raised like 2 million dollars and then another million wow yeah. who, who was the investor who put it so uh, our biggest investor his name is Justin Hamilton ah. yeah and what is his thesis about this his thesis so he's a roboticist himself ah. Ah. and uh, he's someone who's uh, again a solo gp so his decision making was much quicker he's been extremely supportive since then mm. yeah Like so what? so it's one of those things where you need to survive till the point you find uh-huh. you know your 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 angel who actually pushes you towards the end wow yeah that's a very cool story so you know i think what i'm hearing is like the story in your journey like there are so many times when you were like almost the company died but mm-hmm. what kept you going first of all you're a very resilient guy because 2009 to now how many years it has been like definitely 15 plus years now yeah 15 plus years you have been on the grind as an entrepreneur you tried consulting for a bit and you were like no that is not for me but you know this is like what entrepreneurship is like what what do you think like what is your message for people from india who are like i don't want to build hardware like hardware is hard i think see if you dream of hardware you know it's no longer you who does that right like it's it's almost like and i i've started um, you know there's like a spiritual bent to it as well uh-huh. where you know krishna is telling telling arjun right uh-huh. like you know i'm going to make you fight no matter what right yeah. like i'll 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 get you to fight because that's <laughs> what you need to do if yes. it's if it's your calling you'll do it yeah otherwise and i've seen people like i know so many founders in in the bay area who have made a ton of money are and are depressed mm. because you know like you've hit all your boxes yes. you you've checked all your boxes but now what yeah and you know every time it's a very very, very big point you mentioned there are so many founders in bay area who have made crazy amount of money and are still depressed yes and one of the things is like okay and every time i talk to them they are also talking to me about hardware ideas uh-huh. which they never really you know because it was hard and maybe the your vcs don't like it or whatever the reason is they never ended up building it and you know it's one of those things like if you have this idea and if it's if it's your calling go and build it no matter what happens there there's always like there there's always going to be a way like universe always finds a way mm. right and yeah. i've seen companies who would have checked all the boxes like great software companies but then something else happens mm. so uh, you know it's almost like okay universe wants you to do this mm. you will do this in, mm. instead of like okay you can be depressed you can be like okay this is too hard but it's one of those things like if 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 this is your calling you'll end up doing it yeah very cool now i think just let's touch on the indian hardware scene um indian hardware manuf- how what do you think about manufacturing in india now um i think there's still a gap mm-hmm. where if you are young and small the you don't get the economies of scale which you want mm-hmm. and uh, it's one of those things people who you know who have these factories they are not yet into it even though they're like there are people who i like there i know young people who are probably you know who whose parents basically started like auto ancillary for supplying to maruti mm-hmm. but they don't still get into it yet mm-hmm. um but i think it's going to change very soon so mm-hmm. so uh in the next 10 years where do you see jobs getting created uh in terms of uh, like, like in general with the ai and all you know how are you seeing the jobs job market changing uh so see a lot of software can now be generated with just one click mm-hmm. and uh you know it's one of those things where you know it, it kind of is going to become commoditized mm-hmm. because there's no apart from distribution there's no other mode left mm-hmm. so there's going to be a lot of like the 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 software like the or rather the b2b software playbook that has already been written mm-hmm. and you know like okay there are like these five or 10 steps which some some founder needs to do to mm-hmm. get to let's say a decent size mm-hmm. but the problem is like there's going to there going to be a lot of challengers mm-hmm. 
out there because replicating software is yes. becoming easier and easier every you know few weeks mm-hmm. when chat gpt came uh the the cost of token used to be something mm-hmm. now it's um i think 97 or 98% cheaper just the cost of the token of chat gpt yes, uh-huh. yes so uh and i mean the the access is everywhere right like now you can generate code with such ease uh next two years is probably going to be more commodities mm-hmm. and what is going to remain is the hardware experience and i think we have started seeing the glimpses of you know embodied ai mm-hmm. uh sam altman's new company with johnny i is doing something very similar and mm-hmm. you know you you're going to see a lot of new things coming in mm-hmm. coming out so what what all is considered as embodied ai uh so in my definition it's more like okay if your ai can talk to the firmware somehow uh-huh. right and it's giving like a very unique experience to the user that is embodied ai um and it's not just a computer mm-hmm. so it could be your you know something very similar to smartphone i i saw the the device friend where it's a locket which you can wear mm-hmm. and then even the ray-ban glasses mm-hmm. um you could actually ask uh what what the ray-ban glass can see mm-hmm. and it can give you a description i think that is a very good example of embodied ai Mm. and yeah what we are doing is also something very similar you know you can talk and train a robot almost as if you were training a child mm-hmm. to do something and then the robot can repeat those actions and it has better context mm. it 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 it's almost like a having an insect mind mm. yeah so you thank you for sharing all this journey of like you know going through so many hard times like what is something which people can help you in building this hardware and how can they kind of like make it easy for you i think we yeah if you know if it's too generalized i'll say just keep building hardware right uh-huh. like we would love to help you out in any way possible i think one of the reasons why you know in my head why i built this mm-hmm. is because i had to build my truck on my own uh-huh. you know there was help but there was like it was just two guys in a garage at an id which was you know it when it used to rain there was uh, you know drops uh-huh. of water would come down and while we were welding things uh-huh. uh my wish was okay what if i had like a army of robots who could build this mm-hmm. you know it it and i know like places like some places in china where there are like maybe eight robots and one person just cranking out physical parts wow so that is the kind of vision which i have for most of the world mm-hmm. yeah and that would happen if robots one become affordable and one the second easiest to program very cool thank you so much abina uh, for sharing your whole story with us and uh, i know you might be fundraising soon so people can help you with funding as well as like absolutely uh, you can help people build the best hardware and be a guide so thank you so much for offering that and thank you, uh, thank you so much for being our listener yeah absolutely thank you yeah thank you